Hey, how are you doing? So it's Mark Filby Pritchard here from Amy Fielding. I have to get someone else to do these videos as well because you must get the impression that it's just me here. Um, what we're looking at today is ACCA, ICAW, ICAS, CFA and, and other kind of topics. Um, so it's related to exams. Those of you that follow our videos, and I think there's over 100 of you now that subscribe to these things, um, we move around, a lot of the work that we do is fraud and corruption for example, so we've done some fraud and corruption training videos. So we're, we're back to something which I have to say I really enjoy, which is, which is teaching um, ACCA uh, and related exams that have the same kind of topics in them. Um, back in the day, <coughs> excuse me, back in the day, God, over 20 years ago now, he says realising he hasn't shaved again, um, I started teaching something which I think back in those days was called Paper 3.7. Paper 3.7 then morphed into Paper 14, or it could have been the other way around. It started with 14 and became 3.7. It then became Paper, uh, it's now Paper P4. So it's one of the optional papers, which is a great shame. Um, it, it, over the years as well, became a bit of a bucket. There was a very famous examiner who was the examiner for like 15 years or something called Scott Goddard. And Mr. Goddard just used to chuck stuff in there that he was personally interested in. So suddenly we got the appearance of um, options and then the next thing was Black Shoals appeared and, and so on and so forth. Um, one thing that he didn't touch, and that, that's the topic of this, is, is the modified internal rate of return. So we're going to do a little bit of a chat about the IRR and then we're going to come on and look at the modified IRR. Um, and it's a relatively new topic. Um, to say Many of the ACCA papers have come under a lot of criticism from practitioners because the ACCA as a process is driven by people in universities and they tend to include a lot of theories in what they do and without wanting to be too insulting to the work that they do, most of those theories aren't, aren't used um, anywhere in, in real life. The capital asset pricing model and stuff, which is, I believe there are people who touch on it, but really it's not something that would be used every day, medigliano. Um, right, the, the internal rate of return itself is, is hugely important. It's probably, in terms of project assessment, the most important measure that there is. So we get this idea of the internal rate of return. You learn it way, way back at the very, very first level, which is great, and you learn to do your interpolation. In real life, of course, you do your cash flows in, in Excel, and Excel will do it for you. But um, it, it's hugely important, and it is in real life the most important project appraisal technique. So, my name is Mark, paper P4 is really what this is relevant for for ACCA and that's what I've based this on. I'm going to be doing some teaching somewhere on paper P4 this session. Um, if, you, if you're watching this in your ICAW, your ICAS, your South African Institute, it, it's all come, it's all relevant for you guys as well. Um, it's based around the internal rate of return. We're going to have a discussion on the internal rate of return in a minute. If you have any questions, I, I would ask you probably don't put them in, don't put them down here in YouTube. Go onto the website and send them to me on the website because we, we don't have time to go back and check. I think we've got 30 videos or something up now. So if you want to get an answer, we do everything we can to answer and it's completely free. But don't put it on YouTube, put it on um, the website. Okay, internal rate of return and the real topic is the modified internal rate of return. And this is relevant for paper P4 for, for AC. Okie dokie. Okay, so as I said, let's get quite clear on this. The topic today is the modified IRR, which is what ACCA calls this, this technique. Um, let's just spend five or so minutes talking about the IRR itself. The, the IRR, as you will all know, and this is the way that it's taught in, in all exam systems, is, is the um, is the discount rate at which your net present value is zero for a, a project. Um, right, what it's more normally called in real life, therefore, is your yield to maturity or your yield on your project. So it's actually giving you the project itself. You, you need to be completely clear and completely comfortable by the time you get to paper P4 with the IRR itself. You must be able to calculate it. And that's really important because when you're doing that question one and those great big questions, there's going to be very, very few marks for the actual calculation of the IRR itself. And when you're doing your cash flows and so on, you've got to get that stuff done quickly. And you must understand how to do it, because if you don't know how to do it, you're going to have real problems. So I'm not going to show you how to do the IRR. 
if you don't remember, and I've had people who've been on, you know, maternity leave for five years in classes and they've gone, but Mark, I don't remember. You're going to have to go back and look at some of the lower papers and have a look and just make sure that your calculations are up to scratch. There's no shortage of material in the, in the um, internet, so just Google it and find something. Um, what I want to look at particularly though of the IRR, the internal rate of return, yeah, is the advantages and disadvantages of, of it as a topic. Because you need to know what these are and you, you'll be asked them and you should understand them. And the second thing is that one of the disadvantages of the IRR is what drives us to come up with this thing which is called the modified IRR. And it will explain to you what you're doing. And obviously if you understand what you're doing and why you're doing it, then it becomes so much easier to do it. So let me just read the slide to you. Um, right, the advantages of the IRR, and, and it is, this, the IRR is the most widely used project appraisal technique in the world, as far as I know. Um, right, it, it's a percentage so that people understand it. So that's the first thing it says there. Right, well, what we're doing here is we're comparing it to the net present value. Now, all of your textbooks will tell you that the net present value is the best technique that there is to use. Um, and, and theoretically it is. But imagine the scenario, you, you go to your boss, and your, your boss is a, a simple-minded person like myself, and you say to him, look boss, if you understand this project, the value of our company will increase by $247,136.91. Can you see that the guy is just going to look at you and he's going to be like, uh-huh. It, it, psychologically, when you get that kind of a calculation, it doesn't ring true in your mind. Your mind goes, oh my God, how can that possibly be correct? Therefore, if we say, ah, oh, but the return on this project is 10%, oh, suddenly it sounds much better, doesn't it? The fact that 10% gives you a positive net present value, blah, blah, blah. So therefore, when we look at the advantages, it's this idea that people feel that they understand it. Now, the reality is that net present value is actually a better technique. Um, fine. Right, so we get the second point that it's a rate of return. So we know that we know that if we invest a certain sum of money, this is a percentage that we're going to get back. So as long as it's positive, but we're going to get a, a a certain sum back. And it, it ties into the first idea that well, we kind of think that we understand that. Um, right, that gives us a disadvantage. We're okay with the first two points. I think I think the point quite clear when you think about it. People feel they understand that it's quite clear. The advantage is that it's a rate of return as well. So we get this idea that people are comfortable with, I invest 100 bucks and I'm going to get 10% back on my money. And that people are, are happy with that. And it's very, very close to the first point. Um, those two things together give us a, a disadvantage as well. And the disadvantage is that it is a rate of return. So if you invest $1 and you get $1.20 back, you have an IRR of 20%. Yeah? If you invest one million and you get one million one hundred and fifty thousand back, it'll give you an IRR of fifteen percent. Because it's a percentage, the IRR will tell you that the project with the investment of one dollar is better because the rate of return is high. If you have unlimited sums of money, unlimited projects, then, then I guess it doesn't really matter because it is better anyway. You just invest in one million of those little projects, and, and your your yield is high. But the reality in real life is that there will be a limited number of projects and so we're looking to maximize the value of the firm and so the net present value is better, is better again. Um, other things, therefore, it's relatively easy to calculate. Um, you know, what, what the hard thing in real life is doing your cash flow and then once you've got your cash flow is getting your discount rate. So, it's relatively easy to calculate once you've done your cash flow, and, and it's the same for net present value. The cash flow is no easier than the net present value. So therefore, at, at that point, Excel will do all of the hard work for you. Um, there is no need to pick a discount rate. Now again, your textbooks will talk a lot about the cost of equity and stuff, I and mean, how do you calculate the cost of equity? The, the point is, is that if you're a quoted company, your price is changing nowadays by the minute, so your cost of equity is changing by the minute. So where do we get a damn discount rate from? And, and imagine that your ACCA, ACCA has no equity. It has members in a club. So what's your discount rate? What's your cost of what? I don't even know, ACCA must be allowed to borrow money as a cost of debt. 
Um, so with the IRR, we don't have to we don't have to pick a discount rate. So it's relatively easy to calculate compared to a net present value, yeah, because the, the cash flow is the same. So therefore, Excel will do the actual math for you. Um, there's no need to pick a discount rate. We don't need to justify, and then all that other stuff that they teach you, adjusted present value and all that stuff. We don't need to do any of that. Um, and, and it's widely accepted. And widely accepted is is important. Um, you know, we don't just say, oh, well, everyone accepts it, so it must be good. You know, there are lots of things that we just accept that aren't good. But it's widely accepted. So if you calculate the IRR and you go to the bank or whatever. Um, then they will understand the technique. They will know what you've done, and they will, they may or may not accept the numbers. Um, and, and what they're going to argue about is the cash flow anyway. That the process itself in Excel will stay the same. So therefore, those are the advantages. The disadvantages are how to benchmark the second one that we've got there. So let's assume we get an IRR of nine percent. Fantastic. What does nine percent actually tell us? What do you do with that number? So again, we don't have to pick a discount rate, but we get this. We get this added complication that well, so what does it actually mean? Um, so we have an IRR of nine percent. Nine percent at the moment is very, very good in somewhere like Britain or America. If you can get nine percent yield on your project, you're doing really well. Going to somewhere like Ukraine, if you're doing it in Grivnias, I think last week their currency collapsed by fifty percent because of the war down there. So, so therefore, you can see that um, you, you can see therefore that what, what do we actually do with the number? Right. So those are the advantages. That is the percentage, so people feel they understand it, as opposed to an absolute value. It's a rate of return, so again, we can see what return we're earning on our money, how much are we getting back, and that makes it easily comparable across different types of projects and different types of industries. You know, if you have a company that has 10 subsidiaries doing different things, we can see where the best rate of return is on investment. Easy to calculate, it's the cash flow that's hard, and that's the same for the value. Widely accepted, which means that when we talk to people about it, they understand what we've done and what it means. And there's no need to pick a discount rate. And, and in real life, that's very, very important. People I've never seen anyway don't go through all of these things with calculating cost of equity and stuff, unless you work for a specific investment house, which is buying shares to hold for trading stock. The disadvantages are it's a percentage. Um, so therefore, you know, as we said, the 20% of one dollar is considered to be better than 15% of one million, and it's very unlikely in real life that you will have unlimited small projects to invest in. And the thing is, once you get the number, what do you actually do with it? Okay, so that's what we've got. Right, there is one final disadvantage of the IRR, and this is critical because this is what the whole thing is all about. There is a problem with the IRR that we where well, let's stop there. Right, the IRR measures the point at which the net present value is zero. When you have projects where you invest the money, you earn some cash back, then you invest some more money, then you earn some cash back, you will get multiple IRRs. Okay? So we will get multiple IRRs. And, and in a mathematical sense, every single one of those IRRs is valid. So that gives us a problem. What is the correct IRR to take? What's the number that we should actually take? So what we have to do, therefore, in real life is we have to smooth our project so that we only get one IRR. And that is what you are actually doing with the, with the modified IRR. You are smoothing a project so that we knock out all of these multiple IRRs. Right, what we're going to do now is we're going to go on and talk a little bit more about how the problem arises, and I'll show you an example that comes from my real life, and then we'll go through the numbers and what you need to do in the exam. Okay. Okay, so this is an example drawn from, from real life. Um, I just made the numbers up, but the situation is actually true. We had a client, and this is over 20 years ago now. Jesus, this is like 25 years ago now. Um, and they came to us, and they wanted to help us put together a cash flow and a professional uh, uh, business plan, and and they also wanted us to comment on whether or not the, the project was going to be profitable or not. And it was for coal mining in Scotland. Now, for those of you who don't know anything about coal mining in Scotland, uh, first of all, be grateful. But, but secondly, the way that it works is that because of the way that I don't know the land or whatever is in, in Scotland is that you actually get um, you actually get coal lying on the surface. So you buy this big machine which has like a big 
set of teeth on the front like something out of a Scooby-Doo cartoon. And it goes along and it simply just scoops up the coal and puts it into a big pile. Once you've got all of the coal off of the surface, you have to stop and you have to dig a hole. And the hole isn't very deep, it's only like two or three meters. And then when you go down two or three meters, you get the next seam of coal. Once you've exhausted that seam or that line of coal, you then go down another. And, and from memory, you get something like four seams, including the one which is on the surface. So there's one on the surface, and then there's one, two, three underground. And you get this constant process of harvesting the coal. Then you go down, dig a hole, go down a level, harvest the coal, down a level, and, and so on and so forth. Right, the, the effect of that, therefore, is that at each seam becomes almost like a separate business. So seam number one, we, we buy some land, we buy some equipment, and we dig up the coal. Then we stop while we dig the hole. Digging the hole obviously requires money, and there's no income at that point. And then we harvest a second. The, the effect of it is that we get this idea that when you plot the net present value over time, that your graph kind of shoots up and down. Okay, all I want you to be at the moment is quite clear on what the scenario is. So this idea, we invest money, we harvest some coal. We invest some more money, we harvest some more coal. And the effect of doing that is that we go from positive to negative net present value. So make sure you're comfortable with that, because what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you what it looks like on a graph. Okay? Right, take some time, make sure you're comfy. Okay, so have a look at what we've done there for. We've plotted the net present value against the time. And you'll see that with our Scottish coal miner, what's happening is, is that we are going from negative net present value to positive net present value that passes through zero. So that's this phase that we talked about when we were um, dig taking our coal off of the surface. Once we've exhausted the coal on the surface, we then have to spend some more money digging a hole and you can see that we go back again uh, once more to a negative net present value down there in year three, and then it rises again, and we ultimately get a positive net present value at the end. Right. What happens is, and I really, really hope, because when I record this, when I save this from PowerPoint into video, that those red dots don't move, because they moved on one before. But the red dots on there should show you the point at which the green line crosses the point zero. Now, if you calculate if you calculate the IRR, what will happen is that you will get three different IRRs. So where each of those red circles are will give you a different IRR. Now, mathematically, each of those IRRs is correct. Now, if you're going along to look at project appraisal, the question is, which one do you take? Well, the point is, is that we, we just have no idea. I think from memory, it's the final one comes out almost as, as the, the modified answer. But which one do you take? Well, you can't. Now, that gives you an even bigger problem in real life. Because for mining companies, if they're small mining companies, what will happen is that the, that the bank will fund the whole project. So your entire project will be bank funded. And the reason the IRR is so important for small mining companies, and this is true for metals and oil as well as coal, is that the IRR that you agree is the rate of interest on the loan. So you borrow all of the capital that you need, and the interest that you pay is equal to the IRR that you calculate and agree with the bank. Well, if you've got three different IRRs, what's the rate on the loan? Well, you obviously want the lowest one, and the bank wants the highest one. Not really a basis for compromise because the bank goes, no, you can't have the money unless we take the highest one and you don't have anywhere else to get the money from, so you're a bit screwed. Um, right, so what we have to do therefore is we have to smooth that process. So that line needs to become a curved line or a straight line. In, in reality, it should be a curved line. And, and where there is only one IRR. And then we can truly say what the IRR for the project is and we can truly say, if we're a small mining company, what the rate of interest will be. Right, that is what this whole topic is about. And that is what the modified IRR does. It smooths the whole process. And in smoothing the process, it, uh, it gives you just one IRR. So it removes this problem of multiple IRRs. And that's what we're actually doing. Okay, now let's move on and have a look at 
uh, something which is uh, an exam question. I believe I took it from ACC. Okay, so this is taken from um, an old ACCA exam question, which uh, the topic being examined, amongst others, was the modified IRR. They actually wanted you to calculate the IRR and the modified IRR. Um, and I think it's pretty straightforward. You've got the year zero, so the net after-tax cash flows. All right, please just make sure you're comfortable with that. When we drew the graph, we used the net present value. Now what's happening is you've got the net after-tax cash flows. Um, and it tells you there that the company uses a discount rate of, of 10%. Um, I don't think that there's anything really more to say there. That should be, you know, if you're at the level of P4, you should really be comfortable with that. As far as the exam goes, it's always a good idea to get your formats down, so to put this stuff in the table, because then if you screw up by making some stupid arithmetic mistake, the examiner, or the marker rather, be someone like me, can actually see what you've done and they can see that that you really know what you're doing and it's just a dumb little mistake. Um, that's your information. I don't think there's anything missing. hope there's nothing missing. Um, your years, your cash flows. I'm trying to think of something to say, but I don't have anything to say. So let's move on and look at, look at the answer. Right. Okay, let's move on to slide number six then. Um, and I've just actually recorded this and somehow the evil elves that inhabit my computer have deleted it. I have to redo this little video section. So slide number five gave us some inflows and some outflows. And you can see there the left two hand columns we've got. So we've got the project, which is going to be one, two, three, four years long. And we've got some inflows and we've got some outflows. And you will see that we have um, minus 20 uh, at point zero, end of year one, we'll have plus seven, and so on. Right, you know, by the time you get to P4, that information, what it means and what it's telling you, should all be very, very clear. Right, remembering that our topic is the modified IRR, and the object of what we're doing is we are smoothing this information so that we just get one IRR rather than this problem with multiple IRRs. Right, what do we do? What do we do? Right, look at the above the table and you'll see that there are three. It actually says there are two assumptions, which, which is actually correct because there are two assumptions, but it gives you the discount rate as well. So all of our expenses, we assume, occur at time zero. And all of our income occurs at time T4. Right, so make sure that you're quite clear on what those two things mean. And if you're not, stop the video for a minute and just get it clear in your head. Because we are going to, I can just repeat it really, we're just going to assume that all of the outflows, all of the negative numbers, all of the expenses occur at T0, and all of the positive numbers, all of the positive cash flows occur at the end. Object of the exercise, to smooth these cash flows. Right, the discount rate is 10%, and that was given to you. Now, if you're doing this in a big question in the exam, you probably had to calculate that yourself, doing gearing and re-gearing and de-gearing and all that stuff that Rodigliani and Miller talked about. So you've got your discount rate. Um, in the exam, I always assume it's a round number, 8.3% or something. Um, technically, you're supposed to round it up as well. You should never round down, because it could change a negative net present value to positive. But in the exam, the examiner just seems to round to the closest. Right. So. T0, T0, all of our outflows. So have a look at your outflows. So at T0, you have an outflow of 20. So we have a mining question. This is you purchasing the land, the equipment, whatever. Um, and the value of minus 20 at T0, which is our, our, our time point, is minus 20. So we don't have to do anything with that 20. It just carries across. Can I recommend that you do the table as well? Um, bearing in mind that the marker, who will be someone like me, who isn't that smart and doesn't have that much patience, you need, they need to be able to see what you've done. So you've got 20 in the outflow column. Looking at your outflows, therefore, go to year number two. Year number two, we have an outflow of minus three. So have a look at what we do with that minus three. With the minus three, what we're doing is we're bringing it back to T0. So we've got two time periods. So it's three, therefore, multiplied by one, because it's one over, yeah, it's one over, one over, um, one plus R to the N. Right, so one plus 0 0.1, 0 0.1 is your discount rate, it's 10%, so we get 0 0.1, and it's to the value of minus two, so it's one over 1.1 squared. 
Why is it two? Because we need to bring it back to T0, and that's two time periods, so n is equal to two. Therefore, we get at T0, the present value of the outflows is 22.48. Okay, right, just to make sure you're quite clear on what we've done. Outflows, T0, you've got a, an outflow at the end of year two, so you need to discount it by two years. That, that, that's fairly straightforward. So three, therefore, discounted for two years, it's a 10% discount rate. That was given to you in the question here. Gives you 2.48. Now we repeat the process with the inflows. So at the end of year one, we have seven. Right, please notice that you need to increase it, yeah? Because your, your point is the end of year four. Well, this is seven that's in, that's in <coughs> excuse me, that's arising three years before that point. So therefore we need to increase it by three years. So your n is three years. Your discount rate stays at 0 0.1, 10%. So therefore 1.1 cubed multiplied by seven gives you 9.32. Repeat the process for the outflow in year three. Now it's only one year, so it's 1.1, which is one plus 0 0.1 to the power of one, because it's one year. So you need to compound the thing, increase it up by one year. So we get 12, increased by 10%, gives us 13.2. Finally, <coughs> in year four, we don't need to do anything. Year, year four with a time point of year four requires no time adjustment, so we just stay with four. So the value of your inflows compounded forward to year four, therefore, is 26.52. So notice, therefore, that in terms of in terms of project appraisal, you kind of the picture is beginning to build now. You've got your outflows of the value of 22.48. You've got your inflows of the value of 26.52. The only issue that you've got is that your inflows are valued at the end of year T4 and your outflows are valued at T0. So to make those two things comparable, you need to now bring them together at the same time point. And that's what's coming on, on slide number seven. So final slide, final slide. Hopefully therefore slide number six was clear. We valued all of our outflows, make sure I get it right, all of our outflows at T0, all of our inflows at T number four. We have a timing difference. There's four years difference between them. So we have to make an assumption then, or make an assumption, we have to do an, make an adjustment rather, which is more accurate. And the adjustment will show us that at what rate our inflows have to compound at to equal the outflows. So that's what we're doing with this mathematical calculation. And that compounding factor, that discount rate, is your IRR. So therefore, at what point do our Outflows equal our inflows. Have a look on the slide, therefore. We've got 22.48, which was the total value of all of the outflows at T0, and 26.52, which is the total value of all of the inflows. Your IRR, therefore, which is in here is shown as K, at what discount rate are those two things equal? N is 4, because your project is a four-year period, so we have T1, T2, T3, and T4. Please make sure I got that right. So you have four time periods. So therefore, 22.48, which is the value of your all outflows, multiplied or compounded, it's just a compound interest formula, so compounded out over a period of four years, will equal 26.52. So using some witchcraft, we get the value that K is 4.22%. Um, if you get four years, well, first of all, you should have a scientific calculator which required. So you should know how to do this on your calculator before you get to the exam. But if you want to cheat, you just hit the square root button twice and then deduct one. And we get that 4.22%. Therefore, what it's telling you is that your IRR is equal to 4.22%. So if your IRR is greater than your cost of finance, you will accept the project. And if your IRR is lower than the cost of finance, then you won't. And if you are a small oil company, a small mining company, then 4.22%, assuming that this is all agreed, is the value uh, of the interest rate. So that's the interest that the bank will charge you to fund this project. Currently, 4.22%, probably okay. In a couple of years' time, when you're looking at this, you're seeing old men with old-style haircuts, 
you'll probably think, oh, that's very low, back in the good old days. Right, that is the modified IRR. It is something which the latest examiner has put in his exam time and time and time and time again. So you should make sure you, should do, you can do it. And, and it's good as well. I, I, I personally have never taught this full time in a university. I've taught in universities. But I've never taught this as a full time, as a job, had been a university lecturer. I like to see practical application of these things. I like to see paper P4 have as much practice in it as possible. And, and this is good because this is really what happens in real life. We smooth the cash flows and we smooth the cash flows to avoid this idea of multiply IRR. Very, very practical. There you go. If you've enjoyed the video, you can find us on Facebook, anyfielding.com. Come down there. There's a whole load of these things on there now. And, and we're building up as well. We, we do try to do one a week, just a little 20 minute video a week. Um, so we're building up some, so keep coming back. And best of luck with your exams. Hopefully now you know how to do it. Hopefully it'll come up, you get maximum points, and you pass your exam. Any comments, any questions, go to the website and then send us a message. Okay, thanks for listening, guys, and best of luck. And I don't know if you can see this, but it's snowing in New York once again. Okay, bye, anyway.